All right, we can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those who are joining us from the West Coast. Today is the last day of SMA Awareness Month, and as some have called it SMA Action Month. And what better way to end off this month with a great webinar and some excellent speakers who will speak to us about physiotherapy and SMA, specifically related to assessment, treatment, and consideration. So thank you to our speakers um, for agreeing to participate in this webinar, and we're very much looking forward to it. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please, Savannah? Is that working okay? Oh, beautiful, we're already there. Thank you. <laughs> um, so just wanting to begin this webinar outright and uh, acknowledge that the three of us are fortunate to conduct this meeting on the shared unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, Salatooth Nation, and Squamish Nation. We recognize that there are people in virtual attendance who are working and living on the territories of other nations and respectfully acknowledge the land that they are joining us from. Thank you. Um, personally, I'm calling in from the Squamish territory and that's a picture of home um, and I'm very happy to live, work and play here. We would also like to acknowledge the families that have shared their stories, pictures and videos included in this presentation. Each of us feels so incredibly privileged to do what we do and are so thankful that the families we work with have given their permission to share a small piece of their lives with all of you today. So these are the three people that you are going to hear from. Um, my name is Angelina Wolf. I um, work at UBC and um, just to acknowledge as well uh, that the three of us are all working in pediatrics and that's definitely our specialty. So while some of the things that we talk about today will um, apply across the lifespan, we're definitely bringing a pediatric lens to this. And I'm Sylvana. I am a physiotherapist working at Kids Physio in Vancouver. And hi, I'm Neve. Um, I'm a physiotherapist in BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. Great, thank you. Uh, so just a brief agenda. Um, we'll go very briefly over SMA care considerations and how those relate to physio. And then we'll talk again somewhat briefly about physiotherapy assessment for infants and children. Um, I know that there's been other webinars around assessment, so we won't spend much time there. Where we'll spend the bulk of our time is on physiotherapy treatment and presenting cases that um, we've tried really hard to not make specific to any one child uh, and to kind of uh, present on the depth and breadth of what uh, physiotherapy treatment uh, involves and then talk briefly about some other care considerations. And we're gonna do our best to leave lots of time for questions at the end. Okay, so while the words spinal muscular atrophy or SMA do describe one neuromuscular condition, which is caused by a defect in the SMN1 gene, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there are a broad range of presentations. The error in the genetic code results in reduced levels of survival motor neuron protein, which leads to muscle weakness, degeneration, and impaired motor function, which is the clinical presentation that we see in all people with SMA. But how that impacts each individual person varies based on their genetics, access to disease-modifying therapies, when they get access to those therapies, and possibly other factors that we don't know or understand yet. So what that means is there's not really any recipe to follow for physiotherapy, and it's going to be very unique to each individual. So as I said, we tried to make it kind of as generic as possible, but physiotherapy really is tailored to each person. Thanks, Savannah. Um, so, we talked about SMA being complex, and you can see from this picture, um, from the standards of care, uh, that their physiotherapy is really just one piece of a really big picture. Um, the standards of care highlight that well-coordinated interdisciplinary care is required for best outcomes, and physiotherapists need to communicate and coordinate with the person with SMA, their family, and other care partners in order to make a plan and to ensure the best outcomes. Okay, we're going to talk briefly about physiotherapy assessment, and we'll try not to spend too, too much time on this. Again, this definitely has a pediatric lens, as I mentioned at the start. 
Okay, so this one is a big slide. It is a picture of the International Classification of Function, which we refer to as the ICF, which was created by the World Health Organization in 2001. It also shows how it relates to the F words of childhood development, which were published by a Canadian organization, CanChild, in 2012. The F words take the language of the ICF and make it more applicable to children and families. And I'd argue more applicable to anyone that doesn't kind of speak medical um, terms, uh, but they're all based on the same principles. They take what the ICF and the F words do is take a number of really kind of generic ideas about health that apply to everyone. So not just people with any sort of specific health care or health condition or any disease that are meant to apply to all people. The order that they're listed in on this slide, so there's some at the top and some down below, is not meant to imply that there's any sort of hierarchy that one is more important than the other. Uh, in fact, you can see those arrows between all of the, the boxes there that show that they're all interconnected. Um, and this means that changes in one area could have influences in another. And we found out from research that they, that they actually do. As physios, we used to think that we needed to start working on body structure and function, or if we're using the F word on fitness, to make changes in things like function and participation. But we've since learned that that thinking wasn't correct, it was actually wrong, and we can start anywhere in that big picture and arguably should start everywhere to see the best outcomes. And we're gonna to try to talk about that a bit today. I'm going to zip through the concepts really, really quickly so we don't spend too much time on here. And we do continue to touch on them throughout the presentation, but just to kind of give you a quick out overview of them. So fitness refers to how people stay physically fit and healthy. We know the benefits of physical activity are universal for everyone and finding ways to stay fit is an important part of life and really of physio. Function refers to what we do. These are like the ING words of life. So walking, sitting, dancing, communicating. Um, and when we're talking about function, we don't focus on how something is done. There's not a right way to do it. So whether or not you do something with adaptations or not, it, it doesn't matter. It's the, the ING word that matters, the doing. I'll lump friends, family, and fun kind of all into one concept um, and just kind of say that that's what life is all about and incorporating opportunities to make friends with peers hear what's important to families and what children enjoy is a really important part of the physiotherapy assessment process. What treatment looks like will be tailored to each individual person and your physiotherapist needs to really know what is important to you in order to make sure that they're meeting your needs. And the last F word that isn't included in the ICF is just that future line across the bottom there. And that's thinking about having your physiotherapist know what's coming up for you that's going to be, going to be important so that um, we can plan for different transitions, um, plan for growth, plan for all of these things that happen in people's lives. So here we just look a little more closely about how specific physio assessments align with the F words. So things like range of motion, strength, lung function can give us numbers that help us to track change in a person's fitness. The motor function tests that a lot of you are familiar with, so the Hammersmith, the Rome, those kind of things do the same thing for function. And then measures like the CAPE and COPM would give us more information about participation or friends, family, fun, and future. It's important to note that physios use these tools to help provide a framework for treatment, so a way to track progress. But it's also important to think that while changes in these scores help us to track measurable change, they may not track change that is meaningful to you. So if we look at an iceberg, things that we can measure using outcome measures often only capture a small piece of what matters to you. So they're the top of that iceberg. And then everything else is kind of underneath the water and might not be um, might not be captured by those standardized outcome measures. And so what we try to do to be able to try to capture some of that stuff that's below is really focus on family-centered goal-directed therapy to help us create goals that matter to you and then track change that way. Okay, so this is just a 
quick overview of kind of what goal-directed therapy looks like and what that means when your physio says that. So we start by setting a meaningful goal, so up at the top, and we may need to break that down into a smaller goal. So even if that big kind of overarching purpose is broken down into smaller goals, you should still be able to see how those smaller goals relate back to your purpose. So it should never be so far removed from your meaningful goal that you can't see how it's connected. Then we do an assessment to find out where you're currently at and to get a better understanding of where we need to go. Um, then we choose a treatment to try. So there are many, many, many different treatments and approaches that can be used to achieve the same goal. So your physiotherapist and you will work together to choose what is right for you in that moment in time. And that might change. Um, which is why then we move on to an evaluation. So this is like a reassessment. We check in to see if we're making project, pro, excuse me, progress, um, if what you're doing is working, um, or if we might want to try something else. This is also a good time to think about if the goal that you've set is still important to you. Does it need to be changed? Does it need to be progressed? Does it need to be abandoned altogether? And is something else important now? Goal directive therapy is an iterative or continuous process of kind of assessment, reassessment, checking in. Um, you might try something that works perfectly with your physio right from the start, but more often than not, we, we're continually making adjustments with you along the way in order to get the best outcomes. Great. Thanks, Angelina. Um, so Silvana and I are going to start by running through some of the different types of treatment options that we use when looking at developing a physiotherapy plan. As Angie has already mentioned, it is important to remember the physiotherapy is just one facet of care, and in order to achieve individual goals, we often need input from other members of the healthcare team. Um, if we could just go to the next slide, Silvana. This slide demonstrates how we can relate treatment strategies to the F-Words framework. This allows us to provide individualized goal-directed therapy. I'm going to start by talking you through some of the physiotherapy treatments related to fitness, including range of motion, strengthening, breathing, and aerobic endurance. And then Silvana will continue to review some of the ones more related to function, friends, family, fun, and future. So next slide. Thank you. So first up is range of motion. The goal of range of motion can be to maintain joint mobility, prevent or manage contractures, promote function, and maintain flexibility. These interventions can include stretching and positioning. Stretching is usually recommended for segments at known risk of contractures like the hips, ankles, knees. Per the standards of care, a stretch needs to be held for greater than 60 minutes to improve length and 30, minutes, 30 seconds to maintain length. This is a long time to improve length, and this shows why certain strategies like positioning and orthotics become important, and Silvana will touch on this a little more later. Range of motion is especially important at times of growth. SMA can be associated with an increased risk of imbalance between tendon and bone growth, so we can try stimulate tendon growth by putting them under stretch to reduce the risk of imbalance and tightness. And this image on the right here is of a goniometer. You guys may be familiar with it as it's a tool that physiotherapists use often to assess range of motion in a joint. This information can help us inform any changes that might require intervention. So we'll move on to the next slide. So next up is strengthening. If we're working on keeping muscles flexible, we also need to work on strengthening and stabilizing them. How we strengthen can look different for everyone. An individualized program should be devised based on your goals, baseline strength, developmental age, and fatigue ability. Evidence generally shows that progressive resistance exercise is safe and well tolerated with variable results. Um, so next up, we'll talk about breathing. Breathing secretions and respiratory reserve can kind of be your friend or foe when it comes to physiotherapy treatment. We can target them as part of our physiotherapy goals. These goals can include maintenance of chest wall range of motion, trunk control, secretion management, fatigue management, but also challenges with breathing can impact your ability to participate in physiotherapy. 
It's so important to consult with your local healthcare team about respiratory management, as it really does vary so much across the country. And next, we'll just move on to aerobic endurance. Um, this is something that we can work on in physiotherapy too. The activities, as you can imagine, are vast and varied and include things like hippotherapy, which we can see in the bottom corner, swimming, which we've got there too, biking, walking, wheelchair soccer, and other recreational sports like sailing, kayaking, hiking. Activity choices really depend on personal preference and available resources in your community. Mixed evidence regarding benefits, but generally moderate intensity, low resistance exercise is feasible, safe, well tolerated and beneficial. Many activities can be fun, allow for participation with your peers and allow you to achieve other treatment interventions at the same time. Um, now I'll hand you over to Sylvana to talk through some of the other treatments. All right, so the next one up here is gross motor development. So um, for gross motor skills, there are things like catching and throwing a ball, climbing, jumping, or dancing. So what we want to do here is we want to create individualized programs where kids can learn and develop the specific skills that they need for, to achieve the goals that they're interested in and to participate in the activities that they're interested in. So this one starts to move more into that function category. And next we'll talk about equipment. So equipment is a really broad category and the specific equipment that we use will be very dependent on the goals that we're working on. But we can use equipment to facilitate or to help us achieve goals from any of those F word categories. So for example, we can use like in the first picture there, we can use a body weight support treadmill to help us practice gait training. We can use standing frames like in the second picture to help us with standing tolerance or weight bearing tolerance. And we can use adaptive equipment like adaptive bikes to help with those participation and recreation goals. And another piece of that function where equipment can be really helpful for is mobility. So early independent mobility is really important and it's highly, highly encouraged. Being Having that independent mobility is really important for the development of a lot of skills like social skills, language, cognition. So we want to try to encourage that as much as possible and as early as possible. So we can use lots of different types of equipment to help with this, ranging from walkers, gate trainers, power wheelchairs. We can use lots of different types of assistive technology, but we really want to try to encourage that mobility as early as possible and as independently as we're able to get that. Another type of equipment that we can use are orthotics and splinting. So orthotics and splinting can help us achieve goals within that fitness and function goals, and then sometimes as well in some of those participation goals. So for example, we can use splinting to help with stretching or maintaining range of motion to help prevent contractures like Neve mentioned. Um, and we can also use it to help us achieve various positions, like for example, to be able to sit or stand and to be able to tolerate those positions for longer, or we can even use them to help improve balance when walking. The specific wearing schedules for orthotics and splinting are very, very dependent on the specific goal that we're using them for, as well as the individual who's wearing them and what their tolerance is to their orthotic. And it's really important for us to collaborate with the whole healthcare team, especially orthotists, OTs, and orthopedists when recommending orthotics to make sure that we're recommending the correct ones and wearing them for the appropriate amounts. Okay, and then we wanted to touch base on transition planning. This is a really important one for that future F word. Um, in terms of physiotherapists, we are part of an interdisciplinary team, like Angie mentioned earlier, where we work closely with OTs, social workers, and a medical team. And we wanna make sure that we're helping kids as they grow, they'll need new equipment, their interests and their goals will change. So we wanna help them through those transitions. All right. So next we are going to talk about those cases. So we have six different cases that are all centered around a goal category. So like Angie mentioned, it's not going to be a specific child or a specific case for a person. Um, it will just be 
surrounding goals that typically we would find in a, are helpful in an SMA population. And so for each of these, we'll tell you guys about the specific goal that we have, and then we'll discuss some of the treatment strategies that we can use to achieve those goals. So the first goal that we'll talk about is contracture management. So contractures are when we have shortening of the muscle tissues or the tendons around a joint that end up leading to decreased range of motion or mobility limitations in that joint. And contractures are quite common in an SMA population. So our goal here will be to prevent contractures and maximize range of motion to improve mobility, function, and to decrease the risk of pain in the future. So here we have a list of the treatments that we'll use to help us address this goal. And we'll go into detail for each one of those. So the first one that we'll talk about is stretching. So as we've mentioned for SMA population, stretching is recommended for segments that are at risk for contractures. So we can do stretching in a variety of ways depending on what we're looking to do, whether we're looking to increase length or to maintain length. So we can do manual stretching like in that first picture there and this would be helpful when we're using our hands to stretch to just maintain the current range of motion. Doing a 30 second stretch can be helpful if they've already got the full range of motion that they're doing or a 60 second, two minute stretch can be really helpful. But if we're looking to increase range of motion, we'll wanna hold those stretches for longer. And this is where orthotics and positioning come in. So in the second picture, we have uh, AFOs or ankle foot orthoses. So these would be helpful for ankle range of motion so they can help us still maintain range of motion if it's already there or to help us improve the length of those muscles. So the recommendation here would be actually to try to wear those AFOs for anywhere from 60 minutes to overnight, ideally five times a week to help us improve that range. Okay, and then we want to also work on active range of motion. So stretching is more passive range of motion. We're working on achieving those ranges passively and sustained, but we also want to use our muscles to work on that active piece. But in an SMA population, we tend to see some muscle weakness. So they, these kiddos might be having a difficult time moving their limbs against gravity. So we can use gravity eliminated positions to help them use their muscles that might not be strong enough against gravity. So a couple of examples here are lying on their side, like in that first picture, she's lying on, down on her side and we're getting her to reach forward for the toy. She still has to work hard because she has to keep her arm up elevated off of the floor, but this is a lot easier than if she was lying on her back and she was reaching up towards the ceiling against gravity. And in that second picture, we can use slings for the legs to help hold them up so she can move her legs by kicking and bending her knees, um, but she doesn't have to work as hard as she doesn't have to elevate her legs off of the ground. Okay, and then we wanted to talk about positioning as well. So here I wanted to touch base on torticollis. So torticollis is a muscle contracture of one of the muscles in the neck. So we have shortening of one of these muscles and essentially it, pre it prevents them from being able to turn their head all the way in one direction and they'll develop a preference for looking towards one side. And it can be quite common in SMA just again, due to that little bit of muscle weakness in the neck, they might not be quite as mobile. So if they have a bit of a preference, they'll look more to one direction and then those muscles start to become shorter and shorter. So to prevent this from happening or to treat it if it has, has already happened, the first thing that we want to do is to decrease any prolonged time spent in that preferred position that they have. So if they prefer to look to the left, we want to try to get them to actually look to the opposite direction towards the right side, um, to their less preferred side. And we can do that in lots of different positions. So for example, on tummy time, like in the picture here, but we can do that also lying on their side in seated positions or generally just modifying the position so they're not stuck in that same position for a long period of time. 
And then we wanted to also touch base on spinal deformities. So spinal deformities are not technically muscle contractures because they involve the spine, but they still fall into this category. So scoliosis and thoracic kyphosis are quite common in SMA populations because they have decreased muscle tone in their trunk. So scoliosis is when we see abnormal curvatures in the spine and thoracic kyphosis is actually the normal curve in the upper part of the back, but it's exaggerated in the SMA population. So what we do here is we monitor these curves with x-rays by measuring the degrees of the curve. And if the degree is less than 15 degrees, at that point, we just want to monitor the curve, perhaps use some positioning strategies or stretching strategies to help. But as it starts to get into that 15 to 20 degree range, that's when we want to start exploring some thoracic bracing options. So in the picture here, we see a TLSO brace, so she's wearing a thoracolumbosacral orthosis. So these are recommended for posture, so to help improve that spinal alignment and to help promote function. So in this case, she would be wearing this orthosis for five days a week, ideally for an hour or longer, depending on what her tolerance is. And then if we're seeing that that curve is getting above that 50 degree range or increasing more than 10 degrees per year, that's when we might start to discuss some surgery options. Okay, and then we also want to work on scoliosis specific exercises to help perhaps decrease the, the speed at which the curves might progress. So one of the things that we want to work on is elongation. So this means just trying to get the spine really tall or really long. And we can do this with hanging if that's an option, if this is something that the child or the person's able to do. But we can also do lots of modified positions like modified seated and reaching up or using our arms to pull ourselves into a really tall position like in the picture here. And then we also want to work towards achieving a neutral spine. So this can be self-corrected. So if they're able to actively achieve that better sitting or tall position, or we can do this passively using props or equipment like the brace. And once we've achieved that neutral spine, we want to work on activating their core muscles and breathing in those positions. And then the last piece of treatment that we'll talk about for contracture management is water therapy. So because our bodies weigh less in the water, it's easier for these kiddos to move their limbs and achieve that active range of motion. And it also can be pretty fun for them to engage in water activities. Okay, so the next case that we'll talk about is around head control. So in some of that kind of non-sitter SMA population, we'll see some decreased head control. So they might not be able to keep their head up against gravity unless it's supported, or they might have decreased mobility in their head where they're not able to move it independently very much. So our goal here will be able to will be to be able to maintain head control when they're in the wheelchair, so not letting their head kind of flop side to side when they're on the wheelchair, and to be able to turn their head independently to see their environment. So again, we'll talk about all the different treatments that we can use. And I just wanted to mention the treatments that we're mentioning here are just some of the options. Um, of course, there's lots of other ways that we can achieve these goals, like Angie mentioned earlier. So the first one that we'll talk about here is active movements. So we want to try to maximize any voluntary active movement that these kiddos have already. So for example, we can use toys and get them to track toys to get them to move their head, or we can play games where we're getting them to turn their head side to side so that we work within their full available active range to try to maximize and promote that. But if they're having a hard time doing that movement voluntarily, voluntarily, we can use reflexes to help us as well. So in this video here, I'm turning her hips to getting her to roll and there's a reflex that gets her to kind of derotate her body. So it gets her to move her head and this is involuntary. So she, I, she's just doing this because I'm moving her hips, but it's still active. So she's still actively using those neck muscles to help strengthen them. 
Okay, and then we can move on to progress a little bit to holding the head up against gravity. So in this picture here, we're doing some supported sitting. And what we what her job is here is to try to keep her head up and not let it plop back down. So we want to try to make this really fun and engaging for her, keeping perhaps a toy that she really likes in front of her or a family member that can distract her. So she's staying motivated and keeping her head up. And that helps us work on that endurance piece and then as you can see i'm providing some trunk support um, if she doesn't have good head control chances are she's not going to have a lot of good trunk control either so it's very important for us to work on on providing the appropriate amount of support but i'm also using my hands to help facilitate a little bit of trunk extension so it's easier for her to keep her head up in that position and then we can progress from there to make it harder and harder using higher amounts of gravity so we can progress the activity. So in the first picture on the left, she's staying upright, very similar to that supported seating position. And then as we tilt her forward towards that horizontal position, she'll have to work harder and harder to keep her head up against gravity. And depending on which direction we tilt her and how far we tilt her, we can get her to work on different components of of her neck muscles. And then next is tummy time. So tummy time is a great activity that we can use for lots of different reasons. It's really important, but we can definitely use tummy time for head control as well, but it can be very challenging. There's a lot of gravity now because they're in a fully horizontal position and heads are really heavy. So we want to modify the environment so that we can match what their current goals are. So in the picture of, on the left there, we have a pillow, we can use a wedge, um, and this can help them make the activity a little bit easier. We can also use hands-on techniques like in the second picture to help facilitate this movement to make it a bit easier for them. And then as they start to tolerate it more and more and get stronger and stronger, we want to work on that endurance piece of holding their head up a little bit longer in these positions. Ideally, we want to work towards a goal of 30 minutes per day in total. It doesn't have to be in a row and it doesn't have to be 30 minutes of keeping their head up, but that's in general what we're striving towards for tummy time. And then lastly, we want to put her skills into practice. So part of that goal was for her to keep her head up in a wheelchair and not let it plop to the side. So in this video here, her brother is wheeling her around and changing directions quite quickly. And her job here is to try to keep her head up and not let it fall down. And you can see she is loving this activity and having lots of fun with it. And there's the bonus of involving her family in there as well. Okay, and the next case we'll talk about is surrounding sitting balance. So as we move into kind of that more sitter category of SMA, we might find that kids are able to sit, but perhaps don't have the best sitting balance. They might be at risk of falling or they might not be able to move very much in a seated position. So the goal here will be to improve postural stability and balance in sitting to be able to interact with toys and family safely without falling. So we'll go into some of those treatments again here. So the first one that we'll talk about is active sitting. So whenever we're working on independent sitting as a goal, we want to make sure that we're not just passively staying in sitting with lots of pillows propped around. We want to try to make this activity as active as possible so it, we can work more on that function piece. So we can start easy by just getting them to rotate their head a little bit or turn their trunk a bit. And then we can continue to progress by adding some weight shifts or starting to reach for toys out of base of support. And we can also alter the environment to make it harder or easier depending on what they need. So in the first picture on the left, she's sitting on the ground with her legs quite open. So she's got a big base of support versus the picture on the right. She's sitting on a bench, which is a lot harder and her legs are really close together and she can't really bring them apart because they're in this mermaid suit. So it's making it a lot more challenging for her there. And then next we can talk about perturbation. So what we were just talking about whenever a child moves their body, 
um, like their arms or turns their head, their body has to adjust in order to keep that sitting balance. That's called internal perturbations because those movements are generated internally, but we can also use external perturbations to work on sitting balance. So here we can move their body for them or we can move their support surface and they have to use their body's postural reactions to keep themselves stable and prevent themselves from falling. So in these two pictures here, both kiddos are on a swing and we're moving the swings side to side, front and back, twisting them and turning them. And their job is to try to stay upright and not fall down. And this is a lot more challenging than internal perturbations because they can't really anticipate the movement that will happen. And then another type of, per or of perturbation that we can use is bouncing. So in the first video here, we're bouncing her on a peanut ball. It, she's laughing and loving this activity um, which is pretty cute but we can use the sensation from that ball to actually cue her postural muscles to turn on so she's feeling that sensation at her pelvis and this causes her muscles to turn on to keep her in that upright position and we can do this also with other activities like hippotherapy or therapeutic horseback riding in that second picture so the movement of the horse kind of has that same effect and we can do this also by bouncing on our legs or any other bouncy surface. Okay, and then we'll talk about transitional sitting very briefly. Transitional sitting is just getting in and out of sitting. So if a child is able to do that without assistance, that can definitely give them a lot more independence in sitting. But even if they can't do it independently, we can use those transitional movements with assistance to help them increase their confidence with that independent sitting piece. And then lastly, we can use equipment to help with sitting balance. There's lots of different types, but this one here is a Benic trunk brace. It's just a soft neoprene brace, so it doesn't provide too much support, but it does provide a little bit of trunk stability, so it can help achieve that seating posture um, with less energy expenditure. So kids might be able to sit for longer periods of time or be able to sit with better alignment when they're wearing it. Okay, and I'll pass it off to Neve again. Great, thanks Silvana. Um, so our next case that we're gonna talk about are, is floor mobility. So we'll just move on to the goal for that case, which is that the child wants to be able to move around their environment on the floor or bed independently to access their surroundings. What this looks like can be very different for everyone, dependent on their developmental age, functional level, and environmental setup. However, the treatment interventions used and progression of those interventions can be very similar. We're gonna take a look at a few of the different treatment options available to address this goal. Silvana has already spent some time talking about tummy time in relation to um, head control, but that's also something that we can see being used as a functional position when it comes to floor mobility. Um, the first thing we're gonna chat about is rolling. Thanks, Silvana. Um, as you can see in this video, I believe, um, you can see that the child is being assisted to roll through their lower extremity. Um, by beginning to show the child, facil facilitating the child to move, they can then move the rest of their body. But by helping them initiate the movement, we're also showing them and their brain how to carry out the movement and helping with that motor planning and patterning. Depending on how easy or hard this task is, you can progress or reduce the level of assistance required. In the next slide, we can see in this video that the hands-on assistance is taken away um, and the child is able to move independently across the mat. I can promise you that that wasn't an easy task initially and it took a lot of work to get there. Um, some of the ways that you can manipulate the environment to help with rolling in that case is the child can use the surface to help with rolling and reaching over, so holding onto the edge of the mat. They can use their trousers or their legs to pull their own legs over into rolling. This can help promote independence with the movement while still using whatever bits of assistance that they need. Um, it's really important when it comes to more challenging tasks to make it easy enough to be able to complete it without getting too frustrated, but challenging enough to lead the process. So on our next slide, some of the ways of achieving 
independent floor mobility is via crawling and bum scooting. Both of these methods involve some variety of upper extremity weight bearing and lower extremity flexibility and stability. In tummy time, we're starting to work on upper extremity weight bearing. Other variations of this posture are like propped up in a half kneel, like both or high kneel, like in both of these pictures. You can see in the first one that the child has support quite high up towards his shoulders. In this position, he can be independently watching TV. Um, in the second position, you, or in the second picture, you can see that the support is lowered to their hips. This makes it a little bit harder and increases the difficulty. Um, it's super important to think throughout with all the different cases that we want to keep it fun and challenging um, and do whatever we can to increase or reduce the difficulty depending on what we're seeing. So in the next slide, in this video, we can see what happens when we progress from rolling up into sitting. So the child rolls onto her tummy and pushes up through those strong upper extremities into sitting. Um, from this position, we can start to look at four point kneeling. So on the hands and knees, depending on level of function, this can be a completely supported position and we can work on head control and just starting to initiate weight bearing through those limbs and progressing to more dynamic movement as able. Um, it's important to remember that we need to celebrate all milestones and that goals can change over time depending on personal preferences. Another point to take into consideration when thinking about floor mobility is allowing the body to experience different positions on the floor, whether it's actively or with assistance, is important for our brains, joints and muscles. It enables them to receive new information and learn and also helps with just our cognitive development. Um, so then we'll move on to the next slide, which I think goes straight into our next case, which is standing. So when it comes to standing, the goal that I want to explore is being able to stand with or without support at a table and build Lego. And I must say, I think this picture is like the perfect model for that goal. <laughs> it was accidental, but great. Um, so there's a bunch of different treatments that we can use to address this goal. The first one we're gonna look at is ankle stability. Is the child's ankle stability or just lower limb stability in general adequate enough or do they need some form of orthosis to help stabilize the ankles? This is often not a quick answer and it's often a process to help assess what best suits everyone. And there's sometimes a little bit of trial and error. Well, not sometimes, all the time, there's a little bit of trial and error. We have a wide range of different types of devices to help assist. They can vary from just supportive footwear to knee ankle foot orthosis. This picture here is an example of how um, wearing these SMOs, so the supramalleolar orthosis, can help stabilize that flat foot position and give a little bit more stability in standing. It's important to remember that orthotics can provide support to help an individual maintain their foot ankle lower extremity position. This allows us to encourage mobility and ultimately improve stability and success with those treatment goals. So on the next slide, we're gonna look at supported standing. So one way of achieving supported standing is with a standing frame. A standing frame helps provide additional support to assist with alignment and improve standing tolerance. It allows us to achieve benefits of standing earlier um, and likely for longer periods of time than possibly the body could tolerate on its own. Some of the benefits include benefits to our circulatory and digestive system, ability to interact with peers more effectively. Um, I think also the bottom picture is a good example of like the ability to just be up, interact, have a tray for like some functional play and movement. Um, so it can be a good position to just work on some of your other therapy goals in general. Where the standards occur, the optimal frequency is 60 minutes, five to seven times per week. This is quite time intensive, so it is important to be able to incorporate it into your routine. Um, not everyone starts at that time, and it does take time to build up to 60 minutes at a time. So it's just important to speak with your team and progress as able. So on the next slide, we're gonna start looking at some positions for transition into standing. So one of the things that we can look at for that is high kneeling into a half kneel as shown in this picture. Here we can work on hip stability 
and allow for some unilateral weight bearing. Along with, as seen in this picture, some reaching out of your basis support and just challenging that stability and posture. On the next slide, we can see that the child is on a peanut ball and we're rolling forward to stand. This allows her to start weight bearing through her lower extremities and demands a lot more postural stability and muscle strength than when in a fully supported position. On our next slide, we can see another variation, which is a supported stand, squat to stand at a ladder. This could be done at a ladder or just any higher surface. By providing support to the legs and something for the child to pull up on, they're able to more independently work towards transitioning from a squat into a stand, which is a major component required for standing. It's important when we talk about any of these more challenging tasks to think about as you can see in this picture, maybe like the positioning of her spine is not ideal. And it's important that we think about all these compensations that we might see when things get hard. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring those, adapting those and working on those too. One example is if fatiguing with standing or walking, we might need to look at like taking a rest or providing more stability for a brief period of time to like allow for those compensations to minimize. Okay, so on our last slide for standing, um, we can see here two different pictures of standing. One is standing independently with no support surface, and we're challenging that standing position by reaching out a basis support, or starting to anyway, um, for a beanbag. In the second position, we see how we're applying a support surface to give a little bit more stability. The height of this support surface could be changed based on how difficult or easy it is. Um, so then we will move on to walking, which is our last case. So the walking goal for this is to be able to walk in their school walkathon. Um, there are so many ways to assist with achieving this goal, and a lot of them are just building on the components that we've already discussed. So the first thing that we can look at is equipment. We've already talked about assessing and finding different ways to provide support to the lower extremity. The same principles apply here. As you can see in this video, she is wearing AFOs. And then we can also start to look at varied options for equipment to assist. So as you can see, there's a walker here. With this walker, the supports can actually be removed for the physiotherapy session to allow increasing the challenge, but then put back in to when we're expecting the child to walk longer distances with more independence. So again, it's variable and that can be variable based on function, but also just on the day or the time or the interest in participating in the activity. Um, in the next slide, we will talk a little bit about how strengthening and stability is so important in a standing and progressing into a dynamic position. In standing, we can look at being in a standing position still and static, but as with sitting, a static standing position isn't very functional. So we want to start at inc incorporating more challenges and activity. So this can include weight shifting in standing, altering the level of support required, narrowing the base of support, adding unstable surfaces. This picture here is a good example of a child having to walk on a narrow base of support, that's probably foamy, so a little bit unstable, having to step over obstacles, having to tandem stance. So quite a lot of work when you break down the components of what's happening. Again, as with everything, when we're working on strength and stability, we need to make it fun. Um, so on the previous slide, there was a picture of a stomp rocket, which is just generally a fan favorite everywhere I find. So that's a good one. Um, we wanna make it fun, engaging and cognitively appropriate. So on the next slide, we want to make a point that any practice with any of these case studies and skills that is done with physiotherapy, it needs to have a way to be carried out in the home environment, because that is really where change will happen um, when it's consistent and consistent over time. Um, with this video on the left of our friend here walking in the parallel bars, we can see how starting in simple and predictable situations can help. So the ground is flat, she's walking in a straight line, the guarding is consistent from her mom, she feels safe, secure, but hopefully challenged. 
as she progresses, more challenging environments can be worked in, such as like a different surface. So like having to walk on the carpet, like in the picture on the right, um, around corners and lots of distractions going on. Um, and that's it for walking. So I'll hand you back over to Angie. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about some other considerations before we leave hopefully close to 10 minutes for questions. I'll be as quick as I can through this. Uh, so one of the main considerations to think about, particularly with SMA, is fatigue. Um, so we know, as Neve had mentioned earlier, that daily exercise at moderate intensity is recommended for all people, including individuals with SMA, but we also know that overexertion can result in incapacitating fatigue and prevent functional improvements. Um, there is some evidence that individuals with SMA are less responsive to aerobic conditioning than other individuals, including other individuals with different neuromuscular diseases. Um, and so expecting really quick change with respect to aerobic endurance just might not be realistic. So keeping the exercise moderate and consistent and avoiding steep increases in activity, if you think of like the weekend warrior kind of idea, so avoiding those steep increases in activity over a short period of time is kind of how we want to look at things. The other thing we need to think about is balancing the demands of our day with what we have in our energy reserves. So knowing what you need to do over an entire day and uh, making sure that you leave energy for those things that are the most important to you. And one way to do this with respect to physiotherapy is to do kind of some of the things that we were talking about in the cases, incorporating your physiotherapy treatment plan into your daily activities and making sure that um, it's incorporated into things that are fun and important to you. Okay, so which intervention is best? And I think this is a really thing, important thing to touch on. So as we mentioned, there are so many treatment options that we talked about and lots that we didn't talk about. Some of the other examples that come up a lot are things like cages, theratogs, leg pressure machines, locomats, motorized bikes, um, CME, NDT, all these different kinds of treatment that I'm sure you've heard of. Some have good empirical evidence and others have more anecdotal evidence, which means that other families are saying that this has worked well for me, um, or other therapists are saying I've seen this work well. The main consideration is to do no harm. So you should talk to your healthcare team about what is safe for your child and put a plan in place that works for you and your family. It's really important to remember that there are so many different ways to achieve the same goal and not participating in every type of available therapy doesn't mean that you're missing out. That is great. Thank you so much, Sylvana, Neve, Angie, for a really informative uh, webinar. I do see some questions that have come in, so I'll go ahead and start with um, one here. Um, if an individual child has SMA type 3, how many times per week should they engage in a physiotherapy session in addition to aqua therapy and Sorry, which type? They just, they, if they, I think I missed the beginning of the question. Yeah, sorry, it's type 3. Okay, and they were just asking to see how often they should attend physiotherapy sessions as well as aqua therapy and other things. That's so right. we get questions like these all the time and they're very difficult to answer because of kind of what we mentioned that we try to keep things as general as possible, but it really is very difficult um, because every child is a in different individual and they have their own specific goals and their own specific uh, activities that they want to participate in. So it, it really does depend on what goal they're working towards and what types of treatments would be helpful with within that goal. We definitely want to keep that fatigue piece that Angie was talking about into consideration and not over schedule them and try to make uh, more activities have uh, an effect in many of those effort categories. So if they're able to, like if their goal is surrounding swimming, then aqua therapy can be an important place for them to be if, if that can also be fun for them. 
And if they can get some of their physio exercises, like active mobility done in the pool, that's great. Um, for a type three, I, in the past, just to give an example of a type three that I've seen in the clinic, we were working on a specific goal um, related to walking and walking balance. And so we did weekly sessions in physio for a period of time. And then when that goal was achieved, they actually moved on um, to work on other things. They did some hypotherapy and other stuff later on. So it can be a little bit more frequent when they're working on a specific goal and then maybe less frequently if they're working on a different goal and moved on to something else. That's great. Another yeah, and I think, oh, sorry, I think that's just an important point in general, no matter how you present SMA wise, is that when you're working on a specific goal with physio that only physio can achieve, then you might want to increase the frequency. But there are definitely times in the year where, as Silvana mentioned, like these kids can be so overscheduled. So we want to really think about like the balance between activity and living too. And if like physio can help you identify what goals can be worked on through other means that might be more fun, then there are probably certain times of the year where you might just concentrate on doing blocks of swimming instead or doing blocks of horse riding or whatever is going to achieve that goal that you need. So yeah, it's a hard question to be prescriptive. I can't speak anymore. <laughs> prescriptive with because there's no real clear answer. I know that's, that's fantastic. The next question here is with the three drug therapies that are available, what is the data in terms of combining a certain therapy, whether it be Zolgensma, Spinraza, or Rizoplan for physiotherapy? On average, we would expect that there would be better outcomes, but can you speak to if there were differences in any of the research or clinical trial data? Andy, do you want to answer that one or do you? Sure. Um, I don't I don't think that we're that far along with with research um, at this point in respect to combined therapies um, and how physiotherapy impacts um, impacts that. So I, I just don't think that there is a good answer from the research on that for that question at, at this point in time. And hopefully as time goes on, there there will be more, more trials and we can look at kind of how the different therapies and how they interact with physio is um, impacts outcomes. But at this at this time we just don't we don't have data on that. So the best thing to do then is to think of you know your child or yourself as a case of one and what is happening for you with respect to medical interventions, working with your therapist to make sure they look at that sort of that um, circular chart that I talked about with respect to finding a baseline, trying a treatment, and then checking back in to see if it's if it's working or not. And then that that then you can have data on your own specific case. So once again, um, really difficult to answer generally and um, it goes back to each individual and what they have access to being really, really unique and looking at what is going to work for that person specifically. This next one isn't a question, but a comment. So they really appreciated the one video where a sibling was incorporated in um, physiotherapy. Um, this member is mentioning that um, families uh, should be involved in physiotherapy as it takes up much of the time during the week. So they really appreciated that you included a sibling. Another question here is whether physiotherapists work with uh, speech language pathologists on improving vulvar function or is that part of a physiotherapist role or do you work together with FOP on this? Yeah, so it it also, I, I hate that every answer leads with it depends, um, but it does depend a little bit. So I've worked, for example, with uh, very young babies where we work on um, some of the skills that they need, for example, for feeding. So things like tummy time or like the suck reflex can be things that physios might be able to work on if a child is able to feed um, orally. But if other components are, are starting to take place, they might like kids with SMA oftentimes will have a G-tube and be G-tube fed. So whenever those things uh, come into play, we definitely want to incorporate the whole medical team and work together towards uh, achieving whatever goals they have. So physiotherapy might not necessarily be the main uh, person working on, on feeding goals, but we can definitely work 
together with uh, either a speech language pathologist, OTs for feeding studies and swallow studies, and then their medical team um, in terms of the G2 goals. I'm seeing you guys' faces look like I didn't answer the question correctly, so maybe I heard it wrong. No, no, I think you got it. And I think like when it comes to some of the more like respiratory, like vulvar stuff too, um, we definitely as a, I think the goal and I think Angie's slides at the start that show the coordinated multidisciplinary care, our goal should always be to coordinate with the other professionals that are involved and make sure that all our treatment goals are aligned and like working towards the same outcomes. Um, because otherwise, if we're working together against each other with different interventions, we're probably not going to achieve what we want. That's great. The last question here is around any strategies or therapies for pain identification, pain management. Um, I think definitely like over the past year, I've noticed a lot of kids with more chronic pain and trying to incorporate some desensitization strategies into their regular physio routine has somewhat helped. Um, I think, again, it's very individualized, but I think being able to try and identify what's causing the pain um, and whether A, that's something that first of all like sometimes pain might be caused by too much weight bearing so we might need to back off and look at what's different about like the ankle stability and position and standing that's just one example that came up yesterday so it's top of my mind um so we want to try and figure out what's causing that pain and if there's anything that we can do physio wise to alter how we are providing treatment um but then also trying to limit the risk of like going into the chronic pain sector and just looking at desensitizing that area um so yeah there's a few different like desensitization activities that we can do but that's a whole other <laughs> process that's great. and as well with positioning strategies can be really helpful too um for some of the kiddos that have less active mobility making sure that we're avoiding any pressure areas in the wheelchair or the standards um, and making sure that again with that contracture management piece if we can prevent contractures from taking place that can also help and prevent a little bit of pain in the future that's fantastic. Um, just a comment here. Is, this is from an adult affected by SMA. They um, are on Spinraza. Don't engage in uh, physiotherapy, but this session has been a reminder on the value of physiotherapy. Uh, but they also mentioned that the uh, the four Fs that you mentioned uh, in terms of fun would also apply to adults in rehabilitation. They would hope that even though it was developed by Canchild, that that would uh, kind of transition throughout the life um, another Absolutely. similar comment is around COVID-19. Many people have not engaged in physiotherapy over the last uh, year and a half. And this has also been a great reminder around the value of physiotherapy. So on that note, thank you all so much for attending. And thank you so much, Savannah, Neve, Angie, for an excellent talk today. Um, if there are any additional questions, please email research at and of course, we'd like to thank Biogen and Roche for supporting education initiatives like this and have a good rest of your day. Thank you all so much.